Here we go. 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 14. Therefore, key biblical word, Paul or Peter is drawing a conclusion based upon what he just said. Therefore, as a result of these things, beloved, he's going to use that word three times in five verses. Since you look for these things, what things? Now we'll talk about that. Be diligent to be found by Jesus. Here's what you got to be diligent to pursue. Peace, spotlessness, and blamelessness. And regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. Just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you. That's the Apostle Paul. As also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which some things are hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable, remember those false teachers, distort as they do the rest of Scripture, not just Peter's letters or Paul's letters, all of the Old Testament to their own destruction. You, therefore, another therefore, beloved, another beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you're not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness. But positively, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Amen. All right, have a seat. Let's pray. Father, we thank you as we read of Paul's inspired letters and Peter's inspired letters. And when they say the scriptures in the Old Testament... That's our New Testament. That's always a reference to the scriptures in the Old Testament. That what you've given us, Lord, is this completed canon of scripture. For, Lord, you are a mighty God, an amazing God. And you tell us in the book of Romans that when we go outside and we witness the birth of a child and we look at our body that heals and we see the universe and the amazing sunrises and sunsets and everything that we explore in this universe that it, 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 it screams of a, of a creator. It screams of a personal creator, an artistic creator, a, a mighty creator. It reveals your divine attributes. But Lord, we know that this general revelation in creation and also in our conscience, which is reminding us of what is wrong continually, does not lead us ultimately to Christ. We need specific revelation or special revelation. So we're thankful, Lord, that you've given us Jesus Christ clearest representation of who you are, and you've given us scripture, that we will be a church that loves the word of God, that rightly interprets the word of God, understands the word of God, teaches the word of God, and applies the word of God to our own lives. Thank you, Lord, for revelation. Thank you for the great message in scripture, this one of redemption that goes from Genesis all the way to Revelation, about how human beings fell from you, but Lord, through your graciousness and your mercy, you have called us back to yourself by giving Christ to pay the, pay the full payment for our sins, by giving us grace upon grace and adopting us as your children through our faith in Christ. We're grateful, Lord, that we are on the winning team and that we of all people, as we'll learn today, should be at the utmost peace and the most freedom from all anxiety in our lives because of the greatness of what you have promised to us. Thank you for the work you've done in our church, for our new members. Thank you for the incredible soccer clinic that we did last week and all the faithful men and women that serve so faithfully in that regard. Thank you for those that are even watching over our children today so we can participate in the service. Thank you for the work that is being done in the sanctuary. We look forward to getting them back in there. Thank you for the church that is cooperative and patient uh, through these changes as we're now doing the services at the gymnasium. Thank you for the new people that you're bringing out to the church. Thank you for the people that are getting saved and getting baptized. Thank you for all of our elders and deacons and all of their faithful wives. And we pray now as we get ready to go to your word, Lord, that you would bless us. You'd give us the ability to cor correctly understand your word, a desire to apply your word, that you'd minister to our hearts, and that we, as we said earlier, would be engaged in this process of self-examination as we get ready in the right manner to take the elements, the Lord's body and the Lord's blood, as we represent those two very special things of our Christian faith in a proper way. Bless us, speak to us, help us to stay focused and to pay attention. Help me, Lord, to preach your word with joy, with peace, uh, with truth, uh, with conviction. Lord, we're dependent upon you to take that 
and apply it to the hearts in a very special way for your glory and for their joy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'll take you back to 1 B.C. A guy named Simon was born. 25 to 27 A.D., Simon, this guy named Simon gets married, he has children, he and his family and his mother-in-law settle in a town called Capernaum. 30 AD, Simon meets Jesus for the first time. He's introduced to Jesus by his brother named Andrew. Simon's fishing, and while he's fishing, Jesus asks him to be a disciple to follow him. And not long after that, Jesus takes Simon and says, from now on, your name will be Peter, and from now on, you'll be catching men. 31 to 32 A.D., Peter witnesses Jesus' miracles, all of them. I think every single miracle Peter was a part of. Great things like how Jesus walked on water and how Jesus rose the dead. Peter fails to walk on water himself. Peter declares that Jesus is none other than the Son of God. Jesus rebukes Peter for not allowing him to go to Jerusalem. Peter witnesses the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. A.D. 33, Jesus predicts, a sad prediction, that Peter, before the cock crows, you'll deny three times you ever knew me. Peter and the others will fall asleep when Jesus is praying in his most desperate hour at Gethsemane. When Jesus is arrested, Peter grabs his sword and lops off the ear of the high priest. Peter denies Jesus three times, just as Jesus predicted. Peter hears Jesus is no longer in the tomb. Peter runs to the tomb to confirm the news for himself. Jesus appears to Peter on the shores of the Lake of Galilee, and Jesus affirms his love for Peter, and Peter three times affirms his love for Jesus. Peter makes a confession of his love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter sees the ascension. A.D. 33 to 48, Peter and the others receive the gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. By default, Peter becomes the leader amongst the remaining disciples. He preaches several sermons that are contained in the early chapters of Acts where thousands of people come to Christ. Peter performs miracles. Peter suffers for his faith in Jesus. Peter learns that the Jewish customs are over and that Jesus has not just come for the Jews, but he's come for the Gentiles as well. The Apostle Paul, as we'll kind of see today, rebukes Peter in Galatians chapter 2 because when the Jews came, he pulled away from eating with the Gentiles. 1 Peter was written roughly around 62 to 64 A.D. Around 65 to 68 A.D., 2 Peter was composed. Peter assisted his young friend, his spiritual mentor in the faith, Mark, in the writing of Mark's gospel. And then in A.D. 68-ish or so, tradition says that Peter was crucified on a cross, suffering for his faith in Jesus Christ, demanding that he be crucified upside down because he felt it unworthy to die in the same way that his master did. After Acts 13, we really don't know much of what happens to Peter. Acts 13, it goes into the Apostle Paul. When we piece together what we learn from Jewish historians like Josephus and the church fathers like Origen and Tertullius, we get some more information. When we look at 1 Peter and he says he wrote this letter to them who are in Babylon, he is in Babylon himself, Babylon, a code name for Rome. Most scholars believe that Peter made his way to Rome. He was in Rome during the reign of the evil emperor Nero, and at that time he was crucified for his faith. Maybe amongst all the biblical figures, there are a few biblical figures that receive more attention than Peter, right? If I said I want you to teach five lessons on biblical characters, do a a character study and teach children five lessons about five biblical characters, probably one of the five that you'll choose would be Peter. We like Peter. We like to say the life of Peter. Peter was used mightily of the Lord. He was one of our Lord's closest. He was in the inner three. He was the most outspoken of our Lord's disciples. We know that Peter witnessed literally every dramatic thing that Jesus did more than any other person that ever lived on the planet. But I think what we like about Peter is though he was used by God in a profound way, he was also a man just like all of us. He was a man who made mistakes. He was a man of the flesh. And that's what helps me identify with Peter. It's hard for me to identify with David. David was this great warrior king. I'll never be that person. It's hard for me to identify with Moses, the incredible leadership skills that Moses had in leading people from the Egyptian bondage and captivity to the promised land. I I can't identify with Moses. 
It's hard for me to identify with Paul, the great scholar and, and missionary that took the gospel from Jerusalem out to the farthest most points of the earth. But I can identify with Peter. Through the good and the bad and the ugly, I can identify with Peter's impatience and his unbelief and his foolish words and his selfishness. I can identify with Peter because he had a heart just like mine that at some times can be as bold as a lion but sometimes can be a coward. I sometimes can speak things by putting my foot in my mouth but yet it comes from a heart at all times that is always tender and broken. The Bible does not shy away from Peter's mistakes. It's another reason I know that the book is inspired because we wouldn't have those in there if it was written by man. But through those mistakes you see Peter growing Peter repenting, Peter maturing in his faith. And when you read Peter in the Gospels and you read Peter in First and Second Peter, it almost seems like it's a totally different man. Peter loved the church. And his love for the church, he wrote the church two powerful epistles, right? First Peter and Second Peter. And today we are finishing up Second Peter, Lord willing. We will hear from our Lord. Are, are, uh, Peter's incredible words in the last book he wrote and the last words that he chose to include in that book. We know in 2 Peter, Peter says that my death is imminent. He knows that his death is looming near. And he picks up the pen for the last and final time and in these final five verses, he's leaving words for us, no doubt. These are the, the dying words or the final words of a dying man. He's leaving words in our mind that he wants reverberating so whatever he has to say in his final letter in the final verses of his final letter things that he really wants us to know his last words are things that we really need to pay attention to here's the main point how do i live a successful christian life because that's what he wants to leave with us how do i live a successful christian life subtitled final words from a dying man and I found three responses to that as I studied this passage this week. And those are the three sermon points. It's essential that we, point one, know how to act. It's essential, point two, that we know how to interpret the Word of God. And it's essential, point number three, that we know how to think rightly. How to act, how to interpret and how to think. Three essentials if we want to live a successful Christian life. Here we go. First one. How do I act? Look in your Bibles. Verse 14 begins with that key word, therefore. When you do a Bible study and you see the word therefore, you should realize what it is therefore because the author at that point is drawing a conclusion based upon what he just said. He says, therefore, since you look for these things... Therefore, as a result of what I said, you, Christians, should be looking, paying attention to, keeping in the forefront of your mind these things. Well, the therefore is pointing back to what he just said. What did he just say? Because that's what these things would be. And that these things are what we covered last week in verses 10 to 13. That Jesus is coming back. That when Jesus comes back, he's going to come back in an unexpected way like a thief in the night. That this present world, he said three times in those verses, will be destroyed with fire. That he will judge unbelievers. That he will rescue believers and bring them to a glorious place called heaven. And that heaven is described, verse 13, as a place where righteousness reigns. Now, those are things Peter says we should be thinking about. Like every day. We should be looking forward to those things. That my holy, righteous Savior is coming back in holy wrath, not as the Lamb of God, but this time the Lion of Judah. That he's going to pour out wrath on unbelievers, rescue people that love Jesus, that are saved through his blood, that have expressed faith in Christ, destroy this entire world, create a new heavens and a new earth, and in that place will be a place where righteousness always reigns. 
Based on that, what conclusion should you have for how you live your life today? I mean, you're all looking forward to those things, Peter said. That's what Christians do. So based upon that, we bring it back and say, well, then how should I live right now? How would you answer that? The righteous line is returning. He's coming in wrath. He's coming in judgment. He's coming to rescue people that have been pursuing righteousness their whole lives because they've got the Holy Spirit in them. He's taken them to a place of eternal righteousness. How should you live today? Let's see if your conclusion matches what Peter said. He gives us three terms. The first word he uses is we should be living in peace. Anxiety is a big problem in the church. We all struggle with it. It's a sin, you know that. Paul said, be anxious for nothing. One reason I could be anxious for nothing is because I know everything's going to turn out okay. If I said to you, what makes you anxious? I mean, be open with me. Pour out your heart. What, what really makes you worry? You might say, um, I'm scared I'm going to have a stroke one day. Um, I'm, I'm scared I'm going to get into a car accident. Um, I'm scared my kids might run away. Uh, I'm afraid my, my spouse is going to leave me. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. What if I could guarantee that none of those things will happen to you the rest of your life? What if I could promise you that none of those things will ever happen to you? How, how would you? Oh, I'd be worry-free. Well, if that's true, which it is not because Jesus said we're going to have trouble in this world, but Jesus did say, to a greater degree, none of that will happen in the world to come. So, okay, maybe you got 20, 50, 70 years left, whatever. What's that compared to eternity? Because for all of eternity, everything is going to be incredible. You're saved. You're going to go to a place where God's will is always done. You're going to be with your Savior. We're going to wipe away every tear from your eyes. There'll be no more sin. There'll be no more pain. The return of Jesus is Titus 2.13, your blessed hope. For the unbeliever, it should be the greatest fear, but for the believer, it should be the greatest source of peace. I know how this is going to end. I'm on the winning team. I could be. A, I don't know how, how this game's going to go. I might lose a few battles along the way, but when it's all said and done, my team's going to win a championship. I know that. Now I bring it in today, and I, I'm at peace. He is sovereign over all that. And he's using all the bad for my good. There's your freedom for him, anxiety. Second, Peter uses two words that are very closely related. The words, you should also be spotless and blameless. You should be living in peace. You should also live in a way that is spotless and blameless. That, that, that again, in the context of this, that would be what was used of a, of a sacrifice. Before an animal was sacrificed to God, that animal had to be spotless and blameless. God didn't want the garbage. We could translate that by saying, you should be living a holy life. You should be pursuing holiness. Because as verse 13 says... You're going to a place in which righteousness dwells. Albert Barnes, over 150 years ago, said this, a deep feeling that we are soon to stand, and is soon, in the presence of a holy God, our final judge. You will pass the bar when you stand before the ultimate judge of the cosmos cannot but leave us a happy influence in making us pursue purity. You see, the reason we have confidence to stand before Christ when he comes as warrior king is because we are declared innocent by the blood of Christ. So we say, and you've got to know these terms theologically, we are positionally righteous. We are positionally spotless and blameless. When God sees you, Christian, he sees you as spotless and blameless. You're declared that. 
You're still guilty of those things in the sense of you still commit them, but you're declared because Christ has paid the full penalty of them. But positionally speaking, you and I are not spotless and blameless, and we know that, right? Peter's not talking about the position. He's talking about the practical side of it all. The practical side, we're not spotless. We're not blameless. And Peter's saying, this is who you are in the sight of God. You're going to a place where nothing but righteousness reigns, Jesus Christ, the righteous judge, is coming back. Doesn't it stand to reason that right now you should be pursuing a spotless and blameless life? You see, here's how it works for the mature believer. And this is so nice when you see this in mature believers. How are you doing spiritually? I feel like my sin is always around me, and I hate it. I hate it. I try to repent, and I'm, I'm making progress, but it's my every day I'm waking up, and it is this continual fight with sin. I don't want to give in to it. And I can't wait to get to a place where righteousness reigns because I want the battle to be over. Holiness is something we strive for now. And it should be, in a sense, frustrating. What did Paul say? Oh, wretched man that I am. Oh, Paul was a pretty righteous dude. (laughs) Things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I keep doing them. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. We strive, we strive, we strive. And heaven is the the reward to say, now you get what you've always wanted. No more sin. If you're truly saved, you love Jesus more than anything, right? I mean, you have to say yes, or else you're committing ongoing idolatry. (laughs) You love Jesus more than anybody. You have to say yes. He commanded us to say yes. Yes, before we ever give our lives to him. You got to deny yourself, deny everything, take up your cross, follow him. If you love anyone else more than Jesus, you're committing idolatry. That person's the God in your life. And I think it's safe to say that if you love Jesus and you admire who he is, that you'll want to be like him, wouldn't you? Is that a far-fetched conclusion? Is that weird? I love Jesus more than anybody. He's perfect. He's sinless. But I really don't want to be like him. So let's do this test. Let's let's do the spectrum here, okay? We got on this wall, Jesus. We got on that wall, who's the epitome of unrighteousness? It's not your worst enemy. It's the devil, okay? You got Jesus, perfectly righteous. You got the devil, perfectly sinful. Where are you at on the spectrum, practically speaking? We'll just use Peter to help us answer that. Peter described Christ this way in 1 Peter 1.19, that he's the Lamb of God who is unblemished and spotless. That sounds like what I'm called to pursue. Be found in him spotless and blameless, unblemished, holy. Well, Jesus is the epitome of that. The false teachers... 2 Peter 2.13 are, catch this, stains and blemishes. So I got Jesus, I got the false teachers maybe here, and I got the devil there. What are you pursuing? I mean, I know we're not at the wall yet, but, I mean, is the ship moving in that direction? you got the Holy Spirit to help you become spotless and blameless. Your eternal future is spotless and blameless. It's obvious how God expects you to ask now. And Peter, Peter uses that word he loves so much in 2 Peter, verse 14. Be diligent. Just don't, not half-heartedly. You're all out. To be more like Jesus. That's going to make you happy. That's going to make you a better spouse. That's what your kids need to see as an influence in their lives. That's going to reduce the consequences. That's going to glorify God. That's going to increase your relationship with God. Pursue righteousness. Be at peace, spotless, and blameless. Verse 15, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. That's interesting. Because he's speaking to believers. Now, we learned last week in verse 9 that Christ is delaying his return. Remember the scoffers? Peter says, you guys are wrong. He's not coming back because he's slow or he's not faithful to his promises. He's not coming back because he he doesn't want you guys to go to hell. He's given you guys more time to repent. 
He is merciful in delaying his return. Because when he comes back, it's over. But now he says to believers, regard the patience for the Lord's salvation. What he's saying is, Jesus is coming back. We want to be found in him spotless and blameless. And he's delaying that return so the church can clean up their act. Because we're still working out our salvation in that sense. Greater spotlessness, greater blamelessness. That's how we grow. The whole church is at a different point on this, and we're all hopefully going in this direction. Backsliding is going in this direction, right? All right, we've got to get moving here. Um, second point here. Peter now will appeal to another apostle to confirm what he just said. In addition to the right actions, we need the right interpretation of Scripture. Look at the middle of verse 15 to verse 16. Just as our beloved brother Paul, this is pretty cool because what happened before this between Peter and Paul, it's written in Galatians 2, where Peter withdrew from eating with the Gentiles when the Jewish folks showed up, and Paul says, I rebuked him in the presence of all. Well, it shows that they had a good relationship after that, no hard feelings, our beloved brother Paul. According to the wisdom given to him, wrote to you, verse 16, as also in all of his letters, we know Paul wrote many letters in the New Testament. They didn't have a New Testament back then. They probably had some of Paul's letters. That's it. In them of these things, he speaks of these things, which are hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do the rest of the scriptures. That's always Old Testament when used in the New Testament, to their own destruction. Peter is clearly putting Paul's letters on line with Scripture and putting his letters on line with Paul that they're Scripture as well. Paul's doing two amazing things in this verse and a half. He's basically saying, okay, you guys don't believe what I'm saying about the Lord's return, these things, the Lord's return, judgment, righteousness. Well, then go to Paul because Paul said the same things I said. It's not just me. It's, it's what the apostles preach. Jesus coming back and in the light of his return, live a holy life. But it's not just Peter, and it's not just Paul. Wednesday night, Jeb taught us a great lesson at our, at our prayer meeting here from 1 John chapter 2, and he read this verse to us from John, another apostle. Now, little children, abide in him. Walk with Jesus. Stay connected to Christ. So that when he, what? Appears. Second coming. We may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame. You get the picture, right? At his coming. Oh, Jesus, you came back and I find myself over here somewhere. That's, I'm embarrassed. You want to be pursuing Christ. You want to be abiding in Christ. You want to be going in that direction when Jesus returns. That's pretty safe to say, right? Second, Peter cites in verse 16 how the false teachers, and again, that's the major theme. We're interpreting Scripture according to the major purpose and theme of the letter, false teachers, how false teachers would take Paul's letters and twist his words to fit their own desires, which were often, as we learned in 2 Peter, sensual, sexual desires, lustful desires, greedy desires, popularity, money, just like false teachers do today. Peter says there's some things that Peter, Paul says about these things that are tough to interpret. And the untaught and unstable distort them. Well, there's no doubt if you've read Paul that there's things he's said even about the second coming that are a little tricky to understand. And if you read Peter, Peter sometimes is not much better. But what he's talking about here is he's saying not so much just our own Bible interpretation, but how false teachers deceptive individuals, folks that try to deceive an audience, how these individuals who are untaught and unstable distort or twist the Bible to suit their own evil agenda. That's the mark of a false teacher. False, listen, false teachers do not come up and just start preaching you and get you to do things. That's just like a typical charlatan on the street. A false teacher uses the word of God. That's what makes them so dangerous. And they put their material on the internet and they write books and they're filling our pulpits in America and around the world today. They use the Bible, but they twist the Bible in such a way for their own good. When the Bible is preached, the glory should go to Jesus, not the person that's preaching it. 
but they know that they can use this to make a rather lucrative business to get money for themselves, to get the praise from other people, to exalt themselves in a position of authority, to get a gathering of folks that surround them. These are all the sensual, worldly desires that our heart craves after. And they twist this book to get it their way so the glory can go to them. I mean, even Paul was aware of this. If you want, you don't have to. You can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul's words were always misunderstood. In chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians, he said this in verse 9. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. Now, how do I know 1 Corinthians is not 1 Corinthians? Because in 1 Corinthians, he said he wrote that in another letter prior to 1 Corinthians. So there was a letter, and then 1 Corinthians is probably 2 Corinthians, technically. He said, I wrote to you in my former letter that I don't want you hanging around with immoral people. Don't do that. And it was twisted, and it was misunderstood, because the church realized, wow, immoral people... That's, that's really not so much in here. That's the folks out there. That's everybody out there. And because the world is immoral, I'm not going to talk about Jesus. I'm not going to associate with them in any way. I'm just going to live in this little Christian bubble. I'll pull myself out of my mission field. Paul states, clarifies what he meant. I did not mean with the immoral people of this world. I feel like putting like, you idiots. How do you go into the, the outermost parts of the world and share the gospel if you can't be around immoral people? Or with covetous and swindlers, with idolaters? I wasn't talking about not associating with them. He says, if you did that, you'd have to go out of the world, right? I actually wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother. There you go. If there's a boy or there's a girl in the church that professes Jesus and is living in continual unrepentant sin, you don't just turn your back on that. I love what Paul said, they're a so-called brother, right? If he's immoral or covetous, or he's an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or swindling, I mean, he was, don't give this guy confidence that he's okay. What do I have to do with judging the world? I got, I got nothing to do with judging them. They just need Jesus. I'm not going to go out and confront the world on what television shows they're watching they don't get it i just got to share jesus and let them sort it out from there you don't judge those that are in the world you judge those who are in the church those who are on the outside god judges and then remove the wicked man from among you misunderstanding romans is a great example of this I love it because Paul's words were twisted so much by false teachers. I love what he does in Romans. He'll write a statement and then he clarifies it right when he gets done writing the statement because you know someone's going to misunderstand it. Chapter 5, the second to last verse, verse 20, a verse you guys all know. Where sin increased, grace what? Abounded all the more. Is there room in that verse for a misunderstanding? Where sin increased, Grace from God abounded all the more. You hear the false teacher right now ringing in your ears? Oh, dearly beloved, who wants grace? We love God's grace. We should want more of God's grace. And the Apostle Paul told us very clearly at the end of Romans 5 that if you want more grace, you need to sin. Sin. And for a carnal individual that hates righteousness, that's the church he's going to be attending. Because when you sin, you get more grace. Therefore, the more sin, the more grace. Two verses later, chapter 6, verses 1 to 2. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Right? 6.15. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? Oh, there's another one. That's legalism to pursue anything that's righteousness. To have any personal convictions, that's legalism. We're saved by grace. Do what you want to do. And if you goof, there's Jesus to forgive you. He's always there to forgive you because he's a loving God. Just keep sinning all you want. Do what you want to do. Jesus forgives you when it's all said and done. You pray the prayer, you're going to heaven. Don't worry about it. These are the sermons we hear today. 
What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? His conclusion, may it never be. May it never be. You follow the law of Christ because that's God's will for you to live a righteous life. It's important that we are people who know how to rightly interpret our Bibles. I told you a couple weeks ago, I said, I can't come up here, and I don't even know them all. And, and line up, okay, all these guys and girls, guys, here you go. They're up on the screen, all their faces. They're bad, they're false teachers. Here's what this guy teaches wrong. Here's what this girl teaches wrong. Here's what this guy teaches wrong. Here's what, I can't do that, because as soon as I got done and I'm not going to get them all, new guys are going to come on the scene. All I can tell you is do this. Take your Bible. Examine everything you hear, everything you read with the Word of God. That's why we preach in this church from the Word of God. It's all Scripture. And then you can detect yourself what is wrong. The second point, you've got to know how to rightly interpret your Bible. You say, how do I do that? Well, that's, <laughs> that would take a lot of sermons to cover that question. But I'll give, you, I'll give you six quick things to think about that'll pretty much keep you in line. Here you go. Number one, read your Bible in context. None of this Bible bingo garbage. Oh, everyone open it. Open, all right, boom. Here's a verse, and just here's what it means to me. Don't do that. That's why, folks, we preach through biblical books. Everything that I'm saying is within context. Context of the sentence, the context of the paragraph, the context of the letter, the context of the testament, the context of the Bible. It's all within context. That's how we read any document, read Scripture that way. I can't pull things out of context and make them believe anything I want them to believe. If I just read my Bible in context, I could probably complete about 85% of my sermon. It's that important. Second, determine, here's another big one, determine what the author wished to convey, convey to his original audience. So who was the audience? These folks in Asia Minor that Peter was writing to. Why did Peter write this book? What's the purpose in writing it? What's the theme in writing it? It's not, he's not writing to me in the 21st century. He's writing to them. God's words interpreted in the context of what the author intended for his recipients to understand. Then we apply it to the 21st century. Number three, interpret literally. It's not a wax nose. You can't take verses and make them say whatever you want to say. What is the, that's how you read letters. If I wrote a letter to my wife, I'm not expecting her to look at each sentence and then make it say whatever she wants it to say. I have one meaning in that sentence and I expect her to understand that one meaning because it's within the context and the knowledge that she has of me. Interpret literally, unless called to do so by a figure of speech, like, a, like hyperbole or a, sometimes a parable or a simile or metaphor. I love you to the moon and back. It doesn't mean, oh, my husband is going to get a spaceship and go to the moon. He's going to take me with him. It's a figure of speech. Number four, interpret in line with the history and the culture of the letter. That'll give you a lot of good, solid, and what was, how did, how did the people live then? What was the history? What was the culture? Number five, compare scripture with scripture. And as you know, we've done a lot of that as we've been going through First and Second Peter. When I'm giving cross, that's what this is, cross references. When I'm giving you cross references, I'm not saying, hey, here's what Moses said in Leviticus. Well, I don't need to do that when I know this is what Peter said in that same letter. And if it's not that letter, it's what he said in First Peter. And if it's, not, if it's not what Peter said, maybe it's something that Paul said or something that was said within the New Testament. If it's not the New Testament, it's something that was said in the Old Testament. But I'm, I'm staying with cross-references that are close as I can to the author himself. And lastly, number six, check your work with good commentaries. I can promise you, if you're seeing something that no one has ever seen in 2,000 years, you're probably wrong. <laughs> So what Peter's doing now, he's wrapping things up, he's bringing the discussion back to the false teachers, and he's saying, guys, use your Bibles rightly. The Bible verses, listen, have many applications. 
but they only have one interpretation. My letter to my wife has one interpretation. How that gets applied, how she responds, many different ways, but, but there's only one interpretation. And the interpretation is not what she wants it to say, but what I meant when I wrote those words. If you sit under people who misinterpret and misapply Scripture, you're doing it, verse 16, to your own destruction. All right, we've got to finish up here. Number three, how do I think? Verse 17, another therefore, know this beforehand. What? What's the expressed object? He doesn't tell us. What? Know this before what? Well, just stay within the context. What do I have to know? The dangers of false teachers. Because what comes after it? Be on your guard. Well, why do I need to guard? Because there's bad guys out there. Be, know this beforehand, be on your guard. Well, clearly he's talking about false teachers. Be on your guard, watch out for these guys. Negatively, verse 17. Be on your guard, be careful that you're not carried away, Peter says, by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness. This is what we've been covering. Stay firmly grounded in Christ. Be careful what you take in, who you listen to, who you follow. Unprincipled men, false teachers, bad influences. Stand against them. They're coming after you, Peter says. He told us in the last days, false prophets will arise, false teachers will arise. We're living in those days now. Be careful. They're coming after you. We live about, uh, I don't know, half a mile from the ocean. And when a storm is coming in from the east, I love to go down the beach and watch the storm come in. I love to watch the cloud. Did you see that double rainbow, as a matter of fact, over the ocean like two days ago? Incredible. So beautiful. I love to watch the storms come in. I love to watch the clouds. I love to watch the, the wave action. I love to watch the colors of the sky. I love strong winds. I love to go out when there's a strong, I'm not saying like a, a, a category five hurricane here, but good nor'easter coming in. I love to go out and I love to stand on the boardwalk when that wind is whipping down the boardwalk and I love to just stand there, right? Like, like I'm not going to let it push me over. I'm not going to let it push me over. You're almost trying to dig your toes into the planks of wood. I'm just going to stand my ground. And I thought of that illustration just this morning when false teachers come. I'm not going to let you push me over. I'm not going backward. I'm not, I'm, go, I'm, I'm, I'm here, Jesus, and I'm not going to let you push me back. I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm going to keep my guard, Peter says. I'm watchful. On the positive side, verse 18, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, this is the positive side. So what I'm doing now is, not only am I not going to let you push me backward, what's the greatest defense a solid offense that when the enemy is attacking, I'm not retreating, I'm not even standing firm, but I'm going after the enemy, I'm going to move forward. My greatest defense against a false teacher is not sitting idle, not just being like a jellyfish and going with the waves, but rather my greatest defense is I'm going straight to Jesus. And that when those false teachers, those fiery darts from the devil, they're coming at me, but they're not going to penetrate me as long as I'm going in this direction, right? a deeper understanding and application of God's marvelous grace. How do I go in that way? To, to understand God's grace in a way I never have in the past. How good he is. How sufficient that grace is. How marvelous that grace is. How loving and sacrificial God is to give me that grace. To understand that grace to keep pursuing Christ, to understand how good the riches are of my salvation and the grace of the Almighty God. Have any of you guys figured that out yet? Raise your hand. Who's figured out God's grace? Okay, one person. All right, you're wrong. All right, how about when you're in heaven for 10 billion years? Will you figure it out then? You're never going to get it. So you're never going to get to a point where I don't have to do this. I want to know the depths and riches of God's grace. Not that I pray to prayer and I'm forgiven stuff. 
I want to know how good it is. I want to know how good this salvation is. I want to know what Christ went through to pay for all of my sins. I want to know what motivated God to send Christ for my behalf. And I also want to grow in knowledge, as the verse says. A greater appreciation of knowing the blessedness of my salvation. We went through 2 Peter in 11 sermons, only 11 sermons. But I think it's appropriate because the shortness of our study fits very well with the abruptness of this epistle. In the very beginning, Peter wastes absolutely no time getting into his subject. It's like Paul did in Galatians. He presses on without any pauses. There's no breaks at all. Never a chance to come up for air. He keeps going. He keeps writing until he finishes off that which he intended for his readers to understand. And then he gives us a closing. Unlike almost all the epistles, there's no flowerly ending. There's no greetings to the saints or greetings sent to you or received by you. Nothing at all. Very abrupt. Straight and to the point. One old author said, his heart is too full of the fatal dangers which threaten the whole Christian community to think of himself and his personal friends. It's not even on his thought. He's got to get you this information, then I'm going to put the pen down. And now that he's unburdened his heart, he cares to say no more, but ends at once with a tribute of praise to the master that bought him, end quote. And that tribute is this, simply this, to him, to him, be the glory of and be all the glory, both right now and into the day of eternity. That's all that matters. Amen. Amen. Father, we love you. We thank you for your marvelous grace. We thank you for allowing us to persevere. I pray that it was a delight and enlightening experience to work through this incredible letter that you've chosen to preserve in Holy Scripture. So much to learn, so much to apply. We thank you for the elements. We pray that we are living and pursuing righteousness in our lives. Pray that you're guiding us, Lord, even right now as we examine ourselves before we take communion. We pray if there's anybody here without Jesus that they would not partake of these elements. That's not me. That's what the Word of God says because they eat and drink if they do judgment to themselves according to Scripture. Lord, this is communion. This is um, a symbolic event to signify the communion, the fellowship we have with you. And if we don't have Jesus, we don't have God. We do not have the Father. It's clear. If we do not have the Son, we do not have the Father. Only the Son has taken away the sin so we can come into fellowship with you. And Lord, you love this fellowship. And if there's anyone here without Christ, we pray right now that they would receive Christ, that they'd realize they're a sinner. Their sins could do nothing to save them. Their righteous deeds can do nothing to save them. The only hope we have is the Savior that you provided. How could we ignore that? that they today would give their lives to Christ. They just simply would believe upon Jesus, that he took the penalty for all their sin, and they would repent of their sin and trust Christ today. And if they do, they should partake of this. This is not about spiritual maturity at this table. This is about now positional righteousness. Your church that has been bought by the blood of Christ. Lord, bless us. Teach us about your grace now. Give us your grace now. Encourage our hearts. May we grow to love you more. Bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen.